शरार कोविड के इस अंधकार में आप सबको एक रोशनी भरी शुभ दीपावली ये समय है कि हम सब एक दूसरे के सुख दुख बांट ले समझ ले त्योहार में खरीदारी होती है कुम्हार दिए बनाते हैं ठटेरे बर्तन सुनहार जेवरात और बुनकर नया कपड़ा परंतु आज सब हुनरमंद कठिनाई में है द व्यूवर्स ऑफ इंडिया हैव सर्वाइव्ड बिकॉज द वुमेन ऑफ आर कंट्री हैव नॉट लेफ्ट वेयरिंग अ साड़ी दिवाली मींस अ न्यू साड़ी एट लीस्ट बट बी वॉन्ड इफ इट्स नॉट अ फेक made on a machine and sold as handloom it's all about pehchan i was asked a few weeks ago to give a keynote at a symposium on textile heritage and our relationship with the world it is organized by the up institute of design in collaboration with iccr Indian Council for Cultural Relations and inaugurated by the Prime Minister of India Sri Narendra Modi ji a proprit i thought for geo and ahf to use it as our diwali greetings jini ji warp and weft as a metaphor for life of our body and soul of our social and economic connections across cultures indeed our intricate relationships with so many countries this is a hugely topical endeavor and my profound pranams to shipra ji and shri Sahasra Bude ji for organizing this very seminal engagement with textiles perhaps more than the weaving skills i will speak more about our ability to fasten dye on cloth and the enormous color palette we have invented over centuries that has made india what it has become or what it became so i will begin our journey today with the story of color a look at these two colors on this banjara embroidery this piece was found near a city made infamous for kuli tech giving a new adverb for unemployment to be bangalore the red will take you back to the indus valley a civilization more than 4000 years old with a small fragment of coarse cotton perhaps dyed with manjitha or al madder red left its impression around a vessel in mahanjadaro al comes from the root of rubia tinctorum the madder plant set to evoke the concept of power and shakti the second color in this embroidery neela was dyed with indigo replete in dark magical nuances it takes us into the gardens 
of ancient alchemy, laboratories of Rasayan, searching for the elixir of life, freeing body and mind from the onslaught of time. Much else can be read in the balanced play of madder and indigo. One, the color of ox blood, life-giving eternal force. And the other, deep, elusive, resonant with primordial memories. Together, Neelal formed the two ends of India's basic color palette, introducing a new plant chemistry with natural mordants invented by our master dyers. Here was our own tryst with the rainbow. Died in the sap of nature, in fact my grandmother would remember names of 96 colors. I, can't, I barely can remember a few. Like indigo and al, even today, many plants could be used in the disappearing process of natural dyeing that are described in Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia. The discovery of these two colors also marks the beginning of an incredible saga of a nation that actually clothed the world. In colonial times, Indian textiles were an integral part of the glittering wardrobes of royalty. In Europe, the Empress Josephine, the Beauharnais, Napoleon's Beaumont Bonaparte's first wife, was a great admirer of muslin gowns sourced from the subcontinent. Following Marie Antoinette, she helped popularize the fabrics in the Regency courts. Uh, so back to our story of textiles. History shows how cotton muslins from India were highly prized, even in Babylon. They were referred to as Sindhu, indicating their origin in the Indus Valley. Roman Emperor paid fabulous prices for the treasured Indian cottons known as woven winds. In ancient India, cotton muslins produced in the Ganga Yamuna basin were known as king's muslins, chitra virali, pushpa pattas, referring possibly to the patterns of flowers and birds woven on very fine cotton fabric in the manner of intricate muslins of Dhaka and Tanda in Uttar Pradesh. Buddhist literature has many references to the magnificent cotton spinners and weavers of Kashi. Spinning was the work of women and the fabric was calendared and perfumed and so finely woven that oil could not penetrate the cloth. A cotton cloth from Kashi was used to wrap the body of the Chakravarti, the emperor. It was also used on the body of the Buddha when he attained Nirvana, his eternal rest. Over 2,000 years ago, the Earth Shastra refers to textile design workshops established under the patronage of Maurya kings. Gifts of sense, anjan for the eyes, oil, flower garlands and other adornments were given to the weavers to increase their joy and zest in their working. Hundreds of years later, in Mughal India, these wondrous cottons, the Malmal Khas, were given poetic names, Abravan, running water, or Shamam, morning dew. They were said to become invisible when wet and stretched on grass. A panda washing his dhoti could chuck it into the air, waiting for it to dry when it floats down. Ancient India's incredible range of textiles could well be the story of India's wealth. Look at these specimens found in Lower Egypt, made in the 13th to 16th century, now known as the Fustat fragments. Composed largely of printed cottons fixed magically 
with India's discovery of fastening color with Miriad Mayrublam. Notice the colors of Neel and Al on the early specimens, so similar to these Ajarak prints of Sindh and Kutch, made even today. Probably used with great reverence as tome coverings, Indian fabrics, then famous for their quality, were also carried by Arab traders across the seas for barter between Egypt and Sudan. The silk route entrepreneur, as a precursor to our e-commerce today, determined intercontinental trade spanning the globe. There has always been a certain level of give and take in the passage of our civilizations. In 2002, I was commissioned to scenograph the silk route for the Smithsonian and Yo-Yo Ma on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. We were explaining the imperative of commerce and trade for building trust and bridging cultures. I must commend the ICCR and UPID for its inventive use of soft diplomacy. Although I don't think it is soft. Giving creative people an opportunity to foster new relationships through the warp and rift of textiles. This will lead to greater synergy in a neighborhood so beleaguered with discord. In Washington too, waking up to the horrors of 9-11 involving artists and craftspeople from over 22 countries, the names of which Americans couldn't even pronounce. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan was an act of proactive healing. Some of these countries are representing their traditional skills here on this panel as well. Bapu can certainly help us seek conflict resolution of one kind in our troubled subcontinent. I believe what culture can do, politics can't. On the mall, we had laid out artistic renditions made on textiles of major landmarks as sentinels of arrival from Venice, St. Marcos, Basilica, all hand painted, hand done, Istanbul. Jab the Bamiyans in Afghanistan, the Samarkand, Xi'an in China, and the Nara in Japan. All the props built and seen here were handmade and handwoven in India, bringing hundreds of craftspeople and performers together for the first time. When we come together, we create a cultural outreach of a world-class standard. We made dozens of tents and textile walls displaying syncretic representations while enclosing the festival precinct with evocative boundaries that stretched for miles. Here is one kanath demonstrating the quintessential blue pottery committed artists from Jingda Zen to Kurja connecting them from Iznik to Delph. Another with the tree of life motifs, replete in textiles and architecture across cultures spanning the entire trade routes. The prolific carpet trade with its varied and yet uniform itinerations from Korea to Italy were on display. In astronomy, a Timurind concept of the sky from Central Asia, a Jain and Arabic one from India, and a Buddhist design from China, all embroidered in India. Buddhism was the spiritual connect. I got Indian artists to replicate the Dunhuang cave paintings from China on these walls stretching over the entire mall. Millions of visitors visiting Washington 
on the 4th of July weekend seemed to be enthralled with these cross-cultural manifestations. Many learned about other cultures that gave them, for example, the celebrated design of the Capitol Dome, the Washington's Capitol Dome. The media claimed that they'd never seen an event as evocative in this scale before in a country that was also waking up to terrorism. If I may use this opportunity to request the ICCR, why should such elaborate representations of our parts of the world remain showcased only in foreign institutions? I hope our government will promote holding similar cross-cultural manthans, showcasing creative and cultural enterprises of Asia in India as well. Once, obviously, when we can get over the pandemonium of webinars, I will propose at the end of this intervention the setting up of an international secretariat for the world handmade textile biennale here in India. India alone can promote skill based work that hands can create. It's a living tradition. It's agile design, dexterous labor, and the emotional retina must give its soul, making it better than anything that machines can produce. Once again, India must lead the world in creating a brand for a world-class presence owned by the economically vulnerable. So I propose a recurring platform for stock taking of the best that I think the entire world is producing wherever, but it could be centered in India, the Biennale. This will be an ongoing celebration of what hands can do internationally in this age of machine manufacture and AI that is taking over. Now look at this Kalamkari. I picked up in Isfahan 50 years ago. By the way, still the same play of madder and indigo. But it was made in Masli Patnam for Persian Ustads. Look at that date written in Telugu. Notice the space left empty for Iranian buyers to sign their name and sell the product as Isfahani. This was the trade imperative of Make in India more than 100 years ago. So what exactly went missing for so long? Well, actually nothing that can't be set right. With all of you young and bright in this virtual meeting, with many more around the world, I feel sure that answers will come. I thank uh, Shipraji and Sahasa Budeji for inviting me here, for bringing us together. And I can only wish you the best. I wish I was able to actually come here and stay myself, but um, could not for reasons that are beyond my control. And I would end my inaugural keynote here and will take up the rest of my intervention later. Let's go back to 1860s, when a story of greed and invention in textiles was unfolding with the story of colour. The use of alizarine dyes in Glasgow and Manchester, while Indian markets were being flooded with imported textiles. These are some of the labels that were made in England to sell their cloth to us. And notice this oleograph developed from a photograph of a Marwari salesman with sample books of labels stacked in his shop and bales of cloth actually printed in Manchester copying Indian motifs. So more than 150 years ago, a few Englishmen in Her Majesty's service 
began to seek a more conscientious relationship with Indian art. How far is it legitimate to adopt oriental workmanship and design to articles of modern utility? They asked. The theme is much longer, but I'm paraphrasing. And they go into what kind of things you can do. You cannot convert a, a poop on a Thames, um, on an Iravati boat on the Thames. It was funny, but it's a detail. Even some of the gentlemen condemned colonial neglect and criticized this invasion of British-made Indian copies in Indian markets. These pictures are from a document more than 150 years ago. One said, this is what it is actually printed. Of these, below if you can notice, of these printed fabrics I submit samples taken at random as proof that my condemnation is not unjust. As an Englishman, amidst countless unexplored turbulent frontiers, let me briefly touch on one. Tormented by the dark satanic mills of Manchester, tearing into millions of livelihoods of traditionally skilled shilpkars, the very skilled shilpkars of the Indian subcontinent. When the arts and craft movement, bless William Morris and his ilk, were tilting the windmills, challenging the Europeans' industrial revolution, how could England, new machines, survive without new markets? So to open colonised Indians with their own products from England, the British needed to know what India bought. A profound impact was felt on colonised South Asia, grappling with its own creative identity and cultural enterprise. The subcontinent's civilizational memory presented as the other to itself also began its own tutored resources, seeking points of more autochthonous reference. At the turn of the century, the implications for the material culture of an imperial state were evolving. Trying to reconstruct India's mythological and traditional value with products inherited directly from an industrial world order. How sensibilities emanating elsewhere required ingenious interpretation and marketing. Much of what we do today can be traced back. More inclusive footprints were being created with mass production. This context inevitably led to overproduced iconography and a burgeoning demand for easy reproductions and ripoffs. Culture was part of our agenda for liberation. The carelessness today requires to be contextualized. How do we illuminate key moments from South Asia's movement for independence, suggesting contemporaneity? A living, tangible and intangible heritage has many narratives still evolving, waiting to be told. One story extremely important for the future of work was about textiles, especially 100% handmade wonders that were dealt a severe blow with machine-made imitations. This meant the removal of our own scale of balance. The injustice many years after independence left India seeding in synthetics, leaving our rivers polluted beyond belief. This is a question we have to address in India today. Let's fast forward to where this so-called modernization led us. Ramaswamy, a master craftsman living in a small village near Salem in Tamil Nadu, was amongst the few left who knew the process of natural dyes. But forest officials forbid entry for collecting basic ingredients as nature gets covered with poison from our factories. The economic and scientific value of Ramaswamy, people like Chandra Mali, great friend, and thousands like them with traditional skills continue 
to be devalued. Nor do authorities in post-colonial India understand the buzz about these new industries or about the carbon footprints of industries that we have been encouraging. On one hand, it's about challenges. And I will soon tell you about a proposed world handmade textile binale that will address one challenge. On the other hand, how to revive the natural scales of our vocabulary for colour and textiles that have taken away with the cost saving or so called labour saving machines with chemical substitutes and import from our neighbours up there. And so, finally, my friends, to end the colour story, please look at these, this blue and red sofa. Sofa sets being sold in domestic markets. Where is India's hugely evolved balance of colour, its palette of, of intensity going? What am I asking? Firstly, Saving our traditional knowledge systems is a subtle warp. And reviving our hand skills as its deft weft, capable of giving a new vocabulary to all the nations presented in this panel. We must accommodate design to suit our own traditional knowledge systems, fostering effective global brands. We must learn from the people gathered here of where we've gone wrong or what we can do. Secondly, pushing our never-say-die capacity. This has really helped us. Living in many centuries rolled into one indicates the direction suggesting where to go from here. A past that has crumbled can only be revitalized for the present if it has relevance for the people who are living it. Old can be recycled into new. Nothing is totally rejected, like a spiral that recoils and uncoils on itself as long as we keep human skills at the center. For a moment, let's forget history, how, why or what. It all results in myopic policy. Allow me to lend a more human face to the crisis that has led to the marginalization of traditional knowledge keepers, whether they are performers or they are craftspeople or they are what we call folk artists. Thousands of weavers, craftspeople, folk performers, musicians of India live in resettlement colonies and bastis in many Indian cities. In the following slides, I will show you the consequence of one such migration of an experienced, skilled weavers community. It is an example of where indifference and greed can take us. I photographed this part of my presentation uh, more than 30 years ago, when the power loom lobby was wiping out the handloom sector with an ill-conceived act, manipulating textile reservation. This is a threshold of a weavers hut in Chinalpatti that I visited in the 80s. Once a thriving centre for handloom, since a thriving power mill, now in fact, selling its merchandise to big banners. This is the weaver's hut in the same village. Hut after hut was abandoned 30 years ago, as indeed the power looms also went now. There was nothing but a graveyard of silent looms all around. Out of 3,500 weavers, I was able to trace then some of the families from Chinalpatti living in Delhi next to a Ganda Nala in slums near Karolbagh, Janakpuri, Inderpuri. Back then, I had photographed this family of Muthamma. Her son Gopal, who had left the loom to sell balloons, while his equally skilled wife Lakshmi worked as a housemaid. Who knows this man driving a rickshaw? selling vegetables or sifting through garbage is a man well versed in the most ancient of arts that made India famous. In the 90s, I questioned the then government 
that India, many years after independence, poised on the threshold of a new millennium, why is it allowing its venerable traditions to stand vulnerably at the edge of a precipice? Why are they challenged to fly as never before? At that time, 84 people committed suicide in Chirala. There are the same weavers that made India rich, strong and synonymous with quality. Exploring infinite possibilities of one plus one minus one in the realm of pure mathematics. Who will grant such weavers room for choice? In a scenario when India is going everywhere, do these, these less shining find what the economists call their own exit factor? Somewhere, somehow. So, dastakare darya kabino ki umra bhar jati hai. Khud kar lo isap. Hunar mand ka ek din, pa hunar ka ek saal. How did traditional values and livelihoods come to such an end? Why have we lost our sense of relevance and justice? The decline of rural patronage and the advent of mass media and the rise of urban centres, marginalised, skilled artisans, all over. It incited them to migrate, seeking new opportunities. The village, in comparison, seemed to become suffocating. And huge numbers crowded urban India to work in factories and bar rooms. The rich mill owners became richer, circumventing factory laws, declaring bankruptcy with outdated factory looms and pushing millions of work people, workers in bar rooms who were living in deplorable conditions. Up to the 80s of the last century, before the digital billionaires, think who were the richest men in India? All textiles. But machine made? All. Who was going to reclaim indigenous livelihoods for the skilled poor? In the 90s, we would plead for a special status for handlooms as a separate entity, leaving the Ministry of Textiles to do what the industry wanted it to and which was needed. Machine-made inventions were important. Geotextiles, super smart fibers and forged weaves, techno-textiles are the future. But could we afford to ignore the second largest sector of employment after agriculture? India's new handlooms required proactive handholding, export and local promotion as demand could be created. Today, people want ecological, health conscious, natural products that represent slow fashion, conscious consumerism. This trade will reclaim indigenous livelihoods and make us more inventive about traditional knowledge systems. But who will give it an equal attention? Jumping decades, increasing footprints of the machine made in an age of IPRs has led to more and more easy appropriations. Here we see Alexander McQuinn copying the work of the Banjara embroideries. A woman like Shanti Bai can create her own brand, but can't. In Australia, the Aborigines or the Inuits of Canada would have taken the appropriators to court and won. Clothing is like our second skin. We take it either for granted or follow the dictates of a world of fashion that makes us sometimes a insecure and often a mediocre copy of a copy. Learning to differentiate between handmade and machine-made will be the first step towards conscious consumerism for the future. So creating pehchan is an imperative. For example, handmade has to be distinct 
and a step ahead of anything made by power looms. And now the lines are blurred and becoming seamless. Look at this blatant copy made in China. And remember those copies made in Manchester by our colonial masters that I showed you before. How do you find out if the e-cut fabric you bought in a pattern on yarn created with resist dyeing and not an acybernated print? How do you tell the effect of a hand block repetition on silk screen printed yardage imitating hand block motifs with all its charming overprinting defects? How do you differentiate a needle made embroidery from a machine made duplication? Looking ethnic is okay, but what about depriving the original creator with her emotional retina with the intellectual property? How do you discern between a hand printed kalamkari and a digital duplication? How do you detect a computerized jamdani programmed into a paloom compared to a, a real extra weft marvel? It's happened before, the jamavars and the shaldalils and paisleys. There is no end. Khadi is not hand spun when automated with multiple mechanized spindles and umber. A craftsman once told me, but traditions we know where we fall. With machines, we don't know where we land. Critical to development and developing, more classic sense of pechan has been the focus of my work, with traditional textiles especially. Pechan is a matter of connoisseurship. In the realm of textiles, Pechan is the direct encounter with the fabric, its count, its weight, feel. It's a telling detail, the restraint and understatement, the abandonment and modulation of colour, luster, sheen. It indicates an understanding of when and how the fabric surpasses its kind, where exactly it short, falls short and why. It signifies a sense of proportion and of purpose. It implies the ability to visualize the fabric lavished, draped, accented, at its most subtle, to foresee the grace or lack of grace with which it will yield itself, like a woman perhaps, to the softening and maturing of the aging process. A friend of mine once told me about her grandmother's criteria for buying saris. It was that she, it should resemble a well-formed Vaza poo, a banana flower. Intrigued, I asked her to explain. At the time, Kaziwaram saris were hand spun and hand woven. A charkha was used to twist the silk for more tension, and the spinner would twist one lot with her left hand and another with her right. The warp would be set using repeats of four or five left yarn spun yarns and four or five right spun yarns, and then the nine yard sari would be woven with normal one-sided weft. The result was a fabric in which you could see the yarn running left and right, creating fine stereations like the ribs of a banana flower, which gives its, its characteristic red-blue color. When saris are woven in this manner, the red of the fabric is not a single pure red, despite its yarns being dyed in the same dye bath. The sari is a resplendent, two-toned red cloud, arachamegam, made of red and black. A peacock's neck, nilkanta, made of blue and green, or a krishnamegam, woven in blue and red. Finally, allow me to address the present administration. Pechan is shrinking, but there seems to be an urgency about reaching the grassroots with effective development. How can we help change the quality of lives for the millions of skilled but vulnerable craftspeople in such a scenario? The Prime Minister has announced his visionary Atmanirbhar Bharat mission to reskill and upskill a lost generation. It must succeed. Is design going to be the critical part of an answer? Tradition finds no word for design. 
but recognizes its presence in all cultures. Some of us have been grappling with the tensions between what is considered traditional and what is modern. What is craft, art, high, low, urban, rural, western, eastern, popular, classical? Can we bridge these colonial constructs and make our transdisciplinary pursuits more seamless? I've been arguing for the synergy of new couplings under the same banner, the traditional cultural expression and their privileged cousin, the design-led industry, looking into each other as part of a larger canvas for creative and cultural industry. Through all this, our principal concern must be to help the artists and artisans in their own journey for self-empowerment, for rediscovering a new creative place, their creative place, in society. The need of the hour is to evolve a simple narrative to communicate our textile legacy to younger generations. Make them understand the diversity and uniqueness of amazing skills and techniques this legacy celebrates. There has to be coherent effort to forefront creative communities and stop this rut of de-skilling. Once again, the Honourable Prime Minister has emphasised on the need to focus and be vocal for local. India as a living repository of time-honoured skills must show the way locally, regionally, nationally and internationally. Towards this effort, the Asian Heritage Foundation has evolved a very special showcase, a series of recurring, recurrent stock-taking of the world's textile sector at five Biennales. The Biennale will be a unique transdisciplinary platform for revitalizing and celebrating the unique traditions of handmade textiles. AHF has classified three distinct narratives to explain textile technologies as pre-loom, on-loom and post-loom. Pre-loom, on-loom, post-loom to bridge the gap between craftspersons and the discerning consumers. Through astute intervention in design and the application of new media and cutting edge technology, the Biennale will focus on five key skill sets assigned as a property to five host cities in India. Hand spinning in Ahmedabad, Ikat in Pochampalli at Hyderabad, Brocade in Varanasi, Chintz in Jaipur, and Embroidery in Srinagar, Kashmir. Today, culturally, India remains the world's resource, last resource for the most painstaking technique of hand spinning, dyeing, weaving and embellishment. The World Handmade Textile Biennale understands the reality of world textiles that lie between extremities. In the infinite permutation of machine hand interface and a variety of age-old handcraft techniques. To conclude my presentation, let me go back to colour and the metaphor of textiles. May I translate a Mohavra? Rang Raja, Prot Praja, Bhat Dasi. It is said that colour is the king, the fabric the subject, and the motive the maid. Let us for a moment see the colour Neel and Al as a metaphor for India's metaphor for India's balanced spirit, the tenacious fabric as the indomitable skill of its people, the unique design or motif as the unbridled imagination of our culture. At another level, making, doing and being becoming one. To this intangible domain, may I add some concluding thoughts. Consider the Sanskrit meaning of culture, to grow, purify, prepare, polish, consecrate. Gandhiji preferred the word sabhyata, a collective goal, a civilizational process. Pranam, shukriya, dhanyavad.